Welcome to Crosswords, the podcast about practical Christianity. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? How do I live in a culture hostile to godliness? These are questions that we'll answer on each podcast as we get our heart and mind on Jesus. All scriptures quoted are from the New International Version. You can follow me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing. And welcome everybody to our Bible class this Wednesday on this beautiful and refreshing fall-like evening. <laughs> it's still summer. <laughs> Tomorrow's going to be hot again. Oh, there we go. Anyway. So just to do a little review, uh, pick up where we left off yes, uh, last week, many in our culture, just like they did in Jesus' day, use divorce as a loophole to get out of marriage or to try to get out of their current marriage, try to get into another marriage, and they'll use the divorce loophole to excuse themselves or to try to get out of it. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, 31 and 32, it has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So this is the part in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, after the Beatitudes, where Jesus starts contrasting things that they had said before, things that the law said, as he says here, it has been said. And then he's, he contrasts that by saying, but I tell you. Basically, Jesus is kind of like elevating us to a higher level of thinking. And this one is about divorce. Before, hey, you know, you divorce your wife, you want to divorce her, give her a certificate of divorce, it's over. And we actually had read that in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, right here. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing because he finds something indecent about her, writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, sends her to his house. And if she leaves the house, she becomes the wife of another man. Her second husband dislikes her, writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, sends her from his house. Or if he dies... Then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable. So this is basically kind of setting a rule of thumb that if you want to divorce your wife, remember what Jesus had told the Pharisees. Moses allowed you to do this because of your hardness of heart, because they were just finding all kinds of excuses. It was not necessarily adultery. Remember, I want to remind you that if there was adultery and it could be proven, that carried the death penalty. This is divorcing for any other reason, basically because he just finds something shameful. That's what the word indecent here is translated from. He doesn't like her for whatever reason, so he gives her a certificate of divorce, sends her along, and this kind of could keep happening, and each one was another marriage, and that seemed to be fine. There didn't seem to be a problem there. It was actually a way to mitigate uh, and help the, the woman, really, uh, because Back then, women's, women didn't really, didn't really have any rights. And so this part of the law shows us the concern there was for the woman because uh, she was given the certificate of divorce to be able to remarry and not be left alone so that she could be taken care of by somebody. So it's a show in Old Testament law of the concern for the woman not to be victimized in this case even though she was kind of being victimized already by men divorcing for whatever reason. So this is what exists today. I mean, isn't it? I mean, this is what people are doing today. You're divorcing your spouse without just cause. And Jesus is saying here to the, his disciples, he's kind of elevating the law. He wants us to have a higher opinion of marriage, not to treat marriage like a set of clothes that you can change whenever you don't like it whenever it's, it's not suitable for you. Uh, we're not, we don't want to treat each other, especially our spouses, like objects. Oh, I don't like you anymore. I'm going to get another object. You know, I'm going to find somebody else that pleases me a little more. Jesus says that's not 
what marriage was intended to be from the beginning. So he says in Matthew 5, 31 and 32, if you divorce your wife except for sexual immorality, so he's maintaining the clause of sexual immorality, which was adultery. But if you divorce her for any other reason, not only are you making her the victim of adultery, but anybody who's going to marry the divorced woman also commits adultery. So, but I want you to notice, though, that even in the law, as we see here in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, divorce and remarriage was happening. I kind of hesitate using the word remarriage. That's not really a word we find in the Bible. It's just marriage, marrying again, right? Uh, but it was happening even under the strict Old Testament law. Uh, so this is pretty much the picture of what people in the world are doing today, divorcing for any reason. And as disciples of Jesus, we really need to hold the marriage to a higher standard. Notice they were divorcing their wives for something petty. Uh, what many say today might be irreconcilable differences, which means an excuse, everything but the kitchen sink. Uh, but, you know, that's why Jesus said Moses had permitted divorce because of the hardness of heart. So uh, this passage describes the mentality the Jews were defending by their exploitation of the adultery loophole. If we go on to this next passage in Matthew 19, 9, this is what I was trying to get into in our last class. Jesus says here, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, which by the way in the Greek is fornication, sexual immorality, is a translation of the Greek word for fornication, and marries another woman commits adultery, basically repeating what he had said in Matthew 5.31. So Jesus says adultery is committed when the divorce happens without the just cause of someone having been sexually immoral in their marital covenant. You know, when we get married, we say a number of vows, and part of those vows are for better or for worse. And that vow emphasizes the promise to love, to honor, to protect, regardless of what happens. And we need to learn to let go, or we need to learn to go through those difficult tests of faith to weather our marriages against any challenge thrust onto them. Most of the things that make us think about divorce is FOMO. You've probably heard of this. FOMO. What is FOMO? FOMO is the fear of missing out. And it's the anxiety that one has caused by the fear of missing out on a positive experience or a social event, uh, one that you maybe have heard through social media. And it causes social anxiety. And in our days now, when we are more connected than ever before, and we see on our phones, you know, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have Reddit, and it's too much information, TMI, and it's causing us to overthink things. And maybe if you're not feeling too hot in your current marriage, and you see other people having what is seemingly good marriages, you might think that you're missing out on something, and you get this condition that we used to call the grass is greener on the other side condition. We're fooled into thinking that maybe I'll be better off with someone else, when in reality, we're always the ones preventing blessings. If you don't see the grass green on your side, it's your fault. You can do something about it. But, you know, in our days of social media and overconnectedness, it kind of exacerbates the syndrome even more. We think we may be happier if our circumstances were different. Maybe if I had married somebody else. Maybe if I married younger. And Jesus taught the people of the first century that they were not victims of circumstances, that they were masters of their destiny. That's what the whole Beatitudes is about. That's what the whole Sermon on the Mount was about. Jesus was empowering the individual. We have the power to change our trajectory, to maintain a positive trajectory when it gets hard even. But, you know, sometimes we're weak. We don't want to work hard, even though we said 
we will marry you for better or for worse in sickness or in health. Things get tough. All of a sudden, I want to get out of this commitment. How do I get out of this marriage? <laughs> Maybe your situation at home has become predictable. Maybe your relationship with your spouse is stale. Maybe you're lacking in intimacy. And then all of a sudden, at your job, you notice your coworker. Or maybe in your neighborhood, you notice your neighbor, you notice a friend more. You know, you're looking too much to the other side. You think you see the grass is greener over there. Kind of like David, right? David stayed home from war, looked out his window. What did he see? He saw Bathsheba, and all of a sudden, he wanted her, right? He had a fear of missing out working overtime. <laughs> you think you're missing out on something, but that's the lie. You're not missing out. What you're missing out is the opportunity to make things better in the situation you're in right now, to make things better with your spouse, to rejoice in the blessing. Sometimes if you got your mind too much on the FOMO, you can't see what the blessings are from God, the influence God is already giving you. So we need to learn to overcome this because it's one of the main causes of divorce in our society today. Divorcing for any reason, just like the Jews were doing under the law. So how do we overcome this, especially in our overconnected society? You got to focus on the here and now. Things are not going well in your marriage. Things are a little stable. Well, do something about it, man. You know, get some marriage counseling. Speak to one of the brothers who does marriage counseling. Read a book about how to enrich your marriage. We got tons of resources. And just remember, you can't do it all, right? Don't get distracted into thinking, oh, look at all these people doing all these great things. You can't do it all. You got to focus on what's in front of you. Eliminate distractions. Oftentimes, you'll find out that the grass is just as burnt or even more so on the other side. But you, you can make the grass always greener on your side because that's where you got the control. You can't control what's on the other side. So you got to diminish the TMI. Lay off the social media. Lay off the news, you know. Give yourself some peace and focus on what you can do to overcome the distraction, particularly if you're married. Jesus answered here, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Here Jesus makes it clear that this applies to the man as well as the woman. The other passages where Jesus talks about this divorce clause, they mostly mention the male as being held responsible since under the law of Moses, a woman didn't really have the right to divorce her husband, just like we saw in Deuteronomy 24. It was really the husband who was able to give the certificate of divorce. Uh, Mark 10, 11 through 12, taken by itself, would indicate that divorce is forbidden under all circumstances, right? Because he doesn't even include the clause of sexual immorality. So if you go by this verse alone, you're like, oh, you can't divorce at all. Zero zilcho. <laughs> but we know that's not the case. In Matthew 19, 9, Jesus gives an exception. The exception is fornication, sexual immorality, adultery. 1 Corinthians 7, 15 also describes an exception when an unbelieving partner deserts a Christian spouse. They are no longer under the yoke. So those are two exceptions that we know of uh, in a marriage. The Jews wanted to divorce. They wanted to divorce, though. You know, once they were distracted, maybe they got FOMO back in their day, too. Somebody saw somebody else's spouse. They were, would wonder, oh, maybe it's better if I'm married to that other woman. She seems to take care of her husband quite well. My wife is not doing what I think she should be doing. And so they were saying, maybe if I commit adultery, I'll have the excuse of getting divorced, and then I can now get married to that other person. That is what Jesus is addressing here in Matthew 19, that particular issue, the Jews wanted to divorce to marry someone else. They were looking for that loophole in the marriage to fulfill the covenant of another man's wife. So this is what it's about. This answer that Jesus gives 
in Matthew 19 and in Mark chapter 10 was all about coveting. That's what he's addressing. If you divorce your wife to marry another, not only are you committing adultery in your own marriage, but you're committing adultery in that other woman's marriage as well. So there's adultery going all the way around uh, here. And that's what Jesus wanted them to understand. Now, assuredly, there are difficulties connected with this whole subject of divorce and remarriage. People create marital tangles that are so involved that it takes the wisdom of Solomon to extricate all the knots and all the entanglements. The best way to avoid these tangles is to avoid divorce. When divorced people, though, seek fellowship in a local church, the elders and the leaders need to review each case in the fear of God. And every case is different. Every single issue needs to be considered individually. There's no cookie-cutter approach here. These verses show Jesus' concern, though, we can see, for the sanctity of marriage. He wants us to elevate our thinking about the commitments that we make when we issue our vows of marriage. He doesn't want us to be liars. He wants to treat each other with respect. That's how we're going to avoid getting into the entanglement of divorce. The Jews in Matthew 19 wanted to know when it was okay to divorce, as many people in our society do. But is that the right question to ask? When we go to Matthew 19, which is the main passage that people use in discussing divorce, we need to understand what was the motivation behind the question. You know, in, in verse 3, they're asking him here about Moses' certificate of divorce. They say, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And that's kind of like a, they were not really looking at it the right way. They say, well, if we, if we can't divorce, if, 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 if adultery is the only reason why we can divorce, then how come Moses commanded us to give a certificate of divorce? And of course, like I said before, uh, the law really showed the concern for the rights of women during a time then, when women had very little to no rights. And Jesus is kind of elevating our thoughts even more so to protect the women, to have them standing in honor, something that other religions never have given uh, the women. So they're asking here about the certificate of divorce. And, Mo and Jesus pretty much answers, look, your hearts were hard. You weren't thinking about the other person. You weren't thinking about your spouse. Just like the scriptures I shared with you in Micah, when God says, look, I'm the witness in your, in your marriage here, and you're not treating the wife of your youth in the right way. God was really upset about how they were looking at each other. They were looking at each other as possessions to have. They were not looking at each other with, with a, a relational view, with respect. And so that's why this had become a problem. Their hearts were hard. And so Moses issued that certificate of divorce to protect the woman, to protect the victim, the person that would most likely be, be victimized, which was the woman. But I want you to understand something that is revealed here concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Even though Jesus speaks of marriage as a natural law, uh, like he said, it was not this way since the beginning, he says that in Matthew 19, 8, uh, it was not this way from the beginning, meaning that God's intention for marriage, for everybody, not just for Christians, for God-fearing people, but for everybody, he had this idea of what marriage should be. However, even though that, that was a natural law, right, something he said, it's, this is all for all humanity, he specifically addresses the Jews in this case, because only the Jews had provisions made in the law for certificates of divorce. No one else had that. There were other religions that were doing and undoing things concerning marriage. But the law of Moses only concerned God's people, the Jews, when it came to this issue of divorce. So God wasn't legislating and instructing the whole world concerning marriage here in the law of Moses. He was specifically addressing his people, since they were to hold marriage to higher standard. Same goes for Christ. When Christ is addressing the new people, the people that he was preparing 
for the kingdom of God and the Sermon of the Mount. He's calling us, his disciples, to honor marriage, as it says in Hebrews 13, 4. He's not calling the world to do that. The world is already dishonoring marriage. The world has already made a mess of marriage. But it is us as Christians that in Christ, we are called to honor marriage, to keep the marriage bed pure and free of adultery. It is in Christ only that we can start over. We've made a mess of our lives before. If people have divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried over and over without regard to whether it's due to fornication or not, well, in Christ, they can start over. They can live new lives. All those sins of the past are done, are gone, and they can start living that way to please God being held to the higher standard in Christ. But if you're outside of Christ, how can you hold to a higher standard? You can't. That's why you got to get into Christ to hold that higher standard. We can't hold these standards to the world. That's impossible. We got to call them to repentance in Christ so that in Christ they can hold to those standards. So we notice from Jesus' response here in Matthew 19 that hardness of heart due to sin is what causes people to think about marriage in the wrong way and can lead them to divorce. And when is something born of sin considered okay? So it's not a question whether it's okay or not, though. It's just that it happens. You know, divorce will happen. And so this calls for maturity, for grace, and for discernment. I'll give you a few examples. Just because a girl conceived that of wedlock, should we hate the girl and the baby? You know, just because this girl did something immature, did something unchristlike, maybe she's not even a Christian, but she has a, a child out of wedlock. So are we going to hate her? Are we going to hate the baby because it was born out of wedlock? Just because two men fornicated together in, in, in homosexuality, should we hate them? Is that what this is about? Is that why Jesus is giving us these commands and these higher ways of thinking so that we could hate the people who don't hold on to them? No. We know God loves the world, and because he loved the world, he gave Christ. He gave him up so that he could be sacrificed for those sins. We hate the sin, not the sinner. We love the sinner. And if somebody wants to become a Christian and they're penitent, our responsibility is to bear with them because love bears all things. So we bear with the penitent person who perhaps had a child out of wedlock. We bear with them as they seek to be made new in Christ. We bear with those who were homosexuals because they want to become like Christ. We bear with couples who went through divorces and remarriages, but decided to become Christians, and they want to, in the marriage that they have now, honor that and honor the sanctity of it in Christ. We bear with them. Our job as Christians is to show the grace of God and comfort those under the trials they are going through, just as God has comforted us. Isn't that what he says here in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So what should we do then? I'm going to make the question a little more pointed. What should we do if divorce happens among members of the church? What is our calling? What should we do as Christians? Well, don't divorce people need our love and our forgiveness, regardless of what has happened? The Bible doesn't issue any mandate to disfellowship brethren that have divorced. We don't see that in the scriptures. We're not told to treat people who've gone through divorces in a different way. We don't see that in the scriptures. The Bible does not issue any specific instructions of how to deal with somebody who has been divorced. And here's what the Spirit told the Corinthian church in a case where a member of the church had grieved everyone because of their heinous sin. What were the Corinthians told? 
if anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you could stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan may not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. You know, going through a divorce and going through marital issues, the guilt, the shame that people can feel about their sin and their broken relationships can cause such a grief that we don't want to overwhelm them with excessive sorrow, particularly when they are penitent. The punishment is often sufficient for the penitent person. What they're feeling is sufficient, just like in this case. What was the case here? Well, to refresh your memory, somebody had had intercourse with his father's wife. That's a pretty heinous sin. And in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote to them that they really needed to uh, punish this, this guy, you know, give him some church discipline. And apparently they had, because now he writes them in the second letter, okay, now it's time for you to forgive him. You punished him, now welcome him back, all right? It's, you know, your punishment did its work. Now you reaffirm your love for him. So there's a time for punishment. Now there's a time to reaffirm love. Apparently this young man was penitent. He wanted to repent. And so now they needed to show him their support. They didn't want the young man to be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So our job as a church is to make sure we reaffirm our love for the brethren who are going through tough times and who want to do the right thing. We want to be careful not to withhold our love, not to withhold grace, because like Paul says, this is how Satan tries to outwit us, turning us against each other. And we need to be aware of this scheme that he perpetrates to attempt to destroy families and churches. If divorced people decide that they want to remarry, they need our counseling, they need our love, they need our support. They have been forgiven if they repent in the same way that the girl who conceived out of wedlock and the men who fornicated were forgiven if they repent. And we're going to examine more about remarriage in our next section. But as it says in Hebrews 13, 4, our main job as a church is to honor marriage. Marriage should be honored by all. The marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer. God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. He will. So what do we do if a marriage is dead? It's already dead, except for the legal paperwork. Should we try to preserve a dead and dysfunctional marriage? Is that, what, is that the idea God has here? Oh, let's honor dysfunctional marriages. No, not at all. You know, sometimes a marriage has to fail. It's completely dysfunctional. It has to fail. It has to be done away with. You know, what, what else can you do? People made the wrong choice. You know, not that we are advocating divorce here. Not at all. That's not our job. But we honor marriage. God's idea of marriage, not our idea. This is why we offer marriage counseling, to encourage couples to work on their marriage, to learn to honor God in their relationship with each other. Jesus did not put law above mercy in the service of people. We're not having relationships with the law here. We're having a relationship with God, and God is about relating to people. The law has its purpose. We know the Bible says it points us to sin, but the law is not our Savior. Every time the Pharisees opted to pronounce judgment because of their legalism, Jesus pointed them to the true purpose of the law, which is to serve man, not the law. The Pharisees had gone to such extremes in their legalism, they had forgotten what the law was there to do. And they perceived Jesus as a lawbreaker rather than someone who was teaching them to use the law to become more like God 
in his righteousness. The elements of mercy and compassion were forgotten. And the spirit was taken out of the worshiping God in spirit and in truth. They worshiped the law instead of God. Jesus was teaching them about the ultimate reality of the law, which is to point out God's holiness. The law, however, in and of itself, can't make us like God, can't give us holiness. Obedience to God's word out of having sincere faith that God speaks the truth. That's what's credited to us as righteousness. God gives us his law to establish a relationship with him, not with the law. The law was made for man, not man for the law, as we see here. Mark 2.27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Matthew 12.7, Jesus reminds them, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. So to truly honor marriage in the sight of God, we need to learn to honor God as individuals and honor each other. Keep our marriage vows. Don't be a liar. Keep the marriage vow. Work through the hard things. Don't give up. Don't have FOMO. And you'll avoid being a hypocrite, a liar, and avoid getting entangled in a nasty divorce. So to summarize this section, what divorce is not. It's not a piece of paper issued by a human court. It's not a temporary separation. It's not being released by the death of a spouse. It's not an unforgivable sin. And it is not continuing adultery. We're going to address that in our next section. All right. So any questions, please text. You guys must be understanding this really, really well because I don't get any questions. I mean, like one question, uh, but I haven't really got any questions. And this is a, this is a spicy uh, matter here, a spicy theme, but I guess all of you are on the same page. So for discussion tonight, we're going to do the discussion questions that perhaps you didn't get to do in our last class because now we got into the information relating to these questions. Question number one, discuss ways to prevent your mind from settling on divorce as a solution. We know it's not a solution. Hints, what are you looking at, right? Where are your eyes going? FOMO, those are the cues there. We talked about six ways of avoiding FOMO. So I want you to discuss that as it relates to avoiding divorce and making sure that you're enriching the marriage and the relationships that you have now. Question number two, what is within your power to do when you know someone is going or has gone through a divorce? So thank you very much for listening. I hope the Lord gave you insight into conforming to Jesus with today's message. I always appreciate feedback. You can send me your thoughts, musings, and comments directly through the Anchor app. You can also contact me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing.